Hey guys, Taki. And a cat. And a deck spotlight. And weird lighting. So she doesn't complain, we're going to give her some of these. Um, so, the point of today's video is to be reviewing Control Rogue. And I think there's a kind of underrated um, formula when it comes to Rogue. Everyone's just kind of playing oil at the moment. There's some experimentation with Miracle variants, thanks to Tomb Pillager, but frankly, they all kind of suck. Like, the issue with the Tomb Pillager is it's just a less consistent version of Oil Rogue, which does the same thing as Oil Rogue. They work in very similar ways. Um, so I don't think that deck's really worth exploring anymore, but this is. Um, so I'm going to go through the two different variations, basically the Anubarak and the Golden Monkey versions, and then go, you know, from there why I chose the other choices. Right, so first you're saying, okay, why Anubarak, why Golden Monkey? If you're going to be playing a class, other than the fact that I just like Rogue and I was getting my Golden Rogue a while ago, so I just wanted to make a fun Rogue deck, you need to think, why am I playing this rather than, for example, Control Mage or Control Warrior, Control Priest or, you know, Handlock or something. So, if you're looking at your deck and the only good cards in your deck are all neutrals, then you're probably better off doing that as a Warlock, because hero power is insanely overpowered. So, when I first made this deck, and this is the actual higher win rate deck, but we'll go to that later. When I first made this deck, I subbed out Elise, and I was running a new Brack. Now, the reason why I started this deck with a new Brack is kind of twofold. One, this was just before League of Explorers came out, and in the early wings. Basically, before Entomb became a thing. Now, in Tomb, if you don't know, then you haven't been playing Hearthstone recently, but it is the new, um, incredibly OP OP, choose an enemy minion, shuffle it into your deck. Um, this card single-handedly kills a new Brack Rogue. Um, the way you kind of counter it is kind of how you used to make a new Brack work in your list. The way you used to make a new Brack work in your list was you have loads of very high priority silence targets because a new Brack gets absolutely destroyed by silence. If you look at his card text, it's Death Rattle returns to your hand and summon a 4 4 Nerubian. Now, obviously, at 9 mana with only 4 health, if this gets silenced, you're very sad. The reason why this card is good is Control Warrior pre LOE was quite prevalent on ladder and in, even in tournaments. And this card single handedly destroys Control Warrior. Control Warrior, if it's in tournament, they'll run one owl. If it's on ladder, they generally don't run any owls. So you just bait that one silence, no one ever expects it, and that's that. Now, a few people, like Dog and a few other high-profile um, forum members and stream and stuff, have tried making Control Rogue work. The issue with their variations is they only work by surprise. The second the list became known, and people kind of thought, oh, a new Brack is a thing in um, Rogue, people just held on to their silence. So what would happen is they would hold on to their silence, turn, like, 13, you play a new Brack, because you never play him on curve. Um, they just silence it, and you lose the game. And then this became even worse when Entomb became a card, because when Entomb became a card, then priests just do it, and there is no way you can beat a new Brack in your list. So you say, oh, it's simple, you keep running a new Brack, you then add in a silence. Um, this would sort of work-ish, and adding a silence to this deck is a very um, possible tech choice. But this is actually a surprisingly tight list. So what will happen is you'll sub out a card, you put in Al, and then in the Priest matchup, you effectively have two dead cards in your hand the entire game. The reason why I say you have two dead cards in your hand the entire game is the way you play a Nubrak is you hold on to him in your hand until every single piece of removal has been used. This will only work once or twice when no one expects the deck. The second the deck becomes known, people will hold one in Tomb, because they always run two, they will hold one for a Nubrak. So what you'll then be doing is you're holding one in Nubrak as they hold their one in Tomb, and you're holding one Al back, so that when they steal your Nubrak and play it, you can then silence it. It's an incredibly slow format, it doesn't really work, you make your matchups worse, it's just a big no-go. So I benched this deck for quite a long time, and then... After um, all the LOE wings came out, I then actually went back to it. And I'll bring up my win rates um, with my two different versions. So the golden value is the Anubrak list. And as you can see, you know, 69% win rate, um, 32 games played. Okay, it's not a very high number of games played. Um, so you know what rank this is at. This was, I believe, at a rank 3. 
between about rank 5 and rank 3. Um, and then this version is the um, Star Seeker version. And you're saying, wow, it only has a 56% win rate and it has way more games. Um, it has 51 games. Okay, there are two things. Um, one, I think the Star Seeker version is better, even though it has the lower win rate. And two, I played these decks at two very different times in the ladder. Um, the meta favoured the Anubrak version when I was playing the Anubrak version. And I'll get rid of this because it's making me incredibly pale. Um, and this is kind of matchup dependent. And two, when I was doing the Star Seeker testing, I was doing this last night when I was really tired and I couldn't sleep. So there were a lot of misplays going on, even as I was doing the turns. I was like, you know when you, you, you do that turn, you just go, oh god, why did I do that? There was a lot of misplays, and I was playing, you know, at sort of 4 in the morning, not being able to sleep. And I'm pulling a 56% win rate at rank 4. Um, yes, this isn't a legend, but to be honest, at the end of a season, legend is more troll. People at the high ranks of ladder tend to care slightly more about their rating, if they're not me. Um, I'm generally a bit troll when it comes to laddering, but anyway... Um, so I actually think the Star Seeker version is better. I'll kind of go through why. So Star Seeker and Anubrak, they're effectively the same card. Hear me out. They're effectively the same card at two distinctly different mana costs. The way that Anubrak wins games is you play through your entire deck, you play Anubrak, they kill it, you play it, they kill it, they kill it, and they run out of cards, right? And you grind them out. The way that Star Seeker works is you can play it on curve, which is huge, but you play it, it adds a card into your deck, so it kind of helps you a little bit in fatigue. Yes, it's a draw card, but then it adds another card, so, you know, it can kind of help you in fatigue. Um, and all of your leftover, like, your tech choices which weren't available in that mirror, your, you know, removal which you didn't get a chance to use, maybe your weaker heals, maybe a zombie chow you drew late into the game, gets turned into a potential threat. And you grind them out with your new threats. You basically, you're adding threats to your deck. It's good versus aggro. And it's kind of that. So they kind of do the same thing. Except for Elise is playable versus aggro. If I'm against a aggro sham, there's no way, like, there's just no way I will be playing a Nubrak. In a game where you would be playing a Nubrak versus an aggro deck, you've already won. If you're in a position where you can play a Nubrak and they can't kill you the next turn, you've won the game. Um, so you could have played anything, you know, you could have played Nozdumo at that point and you still would have won the game. So I actually think Star Seeker works a lot better and the deck lists, when I literally, when I changed the new Star Seeker, I only changed that one card because my deck already quite heavily favoured Star Seeker. Originally when I first made this deck after LOE, I was running both and the reason why running both doesn't work is they're counterproductive. So the way that a new Brack works is you play it they kill it, it bounces back to your hand. Now the dream scenario is every turn you just keep replaying it. It costs 9 mana. In the case where you have, say, a Thurizen on board which never gets killed and you're constantly playing it for like 7 or 8, you've already won the game anyway, that's not like a real scenario that will ever happen. So what often happens is you play it once, you then stall for a few turns, you then play it again, you then stall for a few turns. The only time you're ever chain playing it back to back is in like very heavy fatigue wars. Um, and then again, you've just kind of like won the game. So more often than not, it's in your hand than on the board. So what will happen is when you play Star Seeker and then you eventually play the Golden Monkey, is you will transform your Anubrak into a lesser legendary. Um, and as they kind of already do the same thing, running both is counterproductive. Both styles of play um, heavily favor fatigue and very long drawn out matches where you'll draw all, if not most, of your deck. So it's not like oh, I have both of them because I'll always draw into one. Um, it just doesn't work that way. You With this deck, you pretty much always draw your entire deck. That's why if you look at it, I'm only running two draw cards in the Fan of Knives. And that's another point I'm going to get onto now. So the big point when people have tried to make Control Rogue in the past and they failed is because they've tried to put the spell power package into the list. If you don't know, which I'm assuming everyone does, but if you don't know, the spell power package which you see in basically every single rogue list ever, is double as a drake, um, one Thalnos. Now, that's three cards, which individually aren't that strong, and all three cards draw a card. Versus control, you don't want to be drawing cards. Um, it wasn't so bad in, you know, older seasons and older expansions, but this last expansion is incredibly grindy, incredibly fatigue-based. The fact that Reno exists, 
the fact that Control Priest exists. You know, people are playing into Heavy Fatigue when it comes to the Control versions. So having three cards which individually aren't very strong and draw your deck just doesn't kind of work. My early versions ran it, but then when you're running those three, you then want to start adding in stuff like Blade Flurry. If you're running Blade Flurry, then you're also running Deadly Poisons. And then suddenly you're running, let's say you only run one Flurry, you're running two Deadly Poisons, one Flurry, one Thalmos, double Azadrake. Let's say you don't run the Thalmos, that's still five cards which individually aren't strong. You've added into your deck. Yes, this makes you better versus aggro, but it makes you much, much weaker versus control. So what I ended up doing is I experimented with Skulker, and I'm incredibly happy with it. The reason why I'm so happy with Skulker is the way that this deck operates is either you have the board, or you have like one creature on the board, and the opponent has the board. So it's not that rare where you're in the case where they have like three damaged minions, and you have a bunch of minions, and you can't ever activate the Skulker. You can always activate the Skulker every game, even if you're just getting one for one value, it's good enough. Versus Paladin, you get amazing value. It's basically adding a third fan of knives into your deck. And let's say you want to do three damage. Doing Skulker into fan of knives is just as strong, if not arguably better, than doing Azadrake into fan of knives. If you do the Azadrake into fan of knives combo, that's a two card combo, it's the same mana cost, and you've done two damage to the enemy board. Yes, you don't have this awkwardness with um, damaged minions, but you kind of get used to playing around that anyway. Um, and you're drawing extra cards, which is something you don't want to do. This hits for three with the exact same combo, and you don't draw a card. And yes, it's not always perfect, because sometimes their minions are damaged, but more often than not, it's fine. So an example of how this um, combo sort of tends to work out is, let's say they play a Doctor Boom, and you have Skulker, and you have Fan of Knives. Then what you do is you do um, Skulker, it clears everything, you then do Fan of Knives, you then do Eviscerate. Um, and that completely kills the Doctor Boom. Now if you were doing that play in a um, you know, spell damage list, it would be Azadrake into Fan of Knives, hitting for 2, Eviscerate for 5, right? And that's a full clear. They're doing the exact same thing in the same amount of cards, but this doesn't draw. And this potentially has more uh, has more potential versus aggro because you're not reliant on drawing into a combo piece. Like if you play in as a Drake on turn five versus Zulok or a Paladin, you're praying that you draw into like a prep board clear. You can just play this and it has that built in. Um, running two of is not good enough versus control because in control it's you're kind of getting maybe two for one value, you're trading with boom, you're maybe killing that wild pyro if you're against a priest, and that's kind of that, or you're like weakening a sludge, like you play refreshment vendor turn four, they play a sludge, you play this, and then your vendor trades in. Um, running two does make your control matchup weaker. If you're only running against like aggro, and you're only playing against like zoo warlocks, um, shammies, and paladins, then you could run two skulkers, and... It's something you could experiment with, but you know I wouldn't really go there. So that's kind of that. Why I haven't included the spell package combo? So the other like big big ones, um, and we'll just kind of run through the list for this because it's, it's just the easy way of doing it. Backstab is standard. I experimented with running only one backstab, but that makes your aggro match up a lot weaker. It does make your control match up stronger. Um, hang on one second. I need to save my cat. She's managed to get herself wrapped in a curtain. One second. Not the brightest of animals, I'm afraid. Uh, there you go. Um, it does make your control matchups weaker, but because we're running Star Seeker now, we can afford to float a dead backstab because we can turn it into a threat later on. Um, one Sir Finley, because I've dropped the Blade Flurry um, Deadly Poison package, and I'm not running Assassin's Blades or anything, usually you don't get that much synergy out of your hero power, you're just using your hero power for favourable trades in the early game, and in the late game it's dead. This is an amazing, amazing godsend versus aggro. What you can do, which is really powerful, is you can dagger up, get some good trades, re-dagger, then play Finley, then get a new hero power. Versus um, any sort of aggro or tempo list, I will never play a turn one Finley. You just don't do it. If you're against a Paladin, you hold the Finley till probably about turn six or seven, 
at which point you've got a substantial value out of your hero power, and that's when you're starting to chip your health away. Once you start reaching that sort of, like, below 20 health point, and you can keep trading into the Paladin tokens, but it starts to get a bit dangerous, because they just keep throwing out threats, that's when you want to think about Finley. Um, jumping ahead a bit, we run Nexus Champion Serad on this list, and there's actually surprisingly good synergy between these two cards. Um, the reason why I say that is that in a control matchup, your hero power is pretty weak, so you don't really care about throwing away the Finley. So what I often do in that kind of case is I'll play Nexus Champion Serad on 5. This is like the dream, like you play it on 5. Control generally can't kill it because they don't have a board, and they're not going to use hard removal on turn 5 on it. If they do use hard removal on turn 5 on a Champion Serad, you're in a very good place. It lives a turn, you dagger up, which gets you a spell, you Finley, get a new hero power, use that, you get a second spell. So you can double activate Serad, and that sounds like a hard to do combo, but it happens in, I would probably say more than half of my games, and um, because I do like having the dagger hero power early on, and I very rarely play a turn one Finley, it just sort of works out naturally. And the games where I will do turn one Finleys, of us aggro sham because in aggro sham get much value outside of my dagger it's up for maybe killing a lepernome but in most cases i'd rather use one of my other creatures because i don't want to be taking that extra face damage um quickly jumping back to finley i'm going to very very briefly mention the like power priority i'll cover that more in the gameplay which we'll do after the deck list which will take a while to get through because it's kind of a weird list um versus priest you don't want to go for Warlock Hero Power. Whatever you do, do not take Warlock Hero Power versus Priests. Uh, it doesn't matter if they're Dragon or if they're Control. What often happens when I first start playing this is I go, oh, Warlock Hero Power is the best Hero Power in the game. Always pick it. And I'm just playing my deck out naturally. I'm tapping every now and again. And not only am I sort of making myself weaker, because it like does damage to my face, I then suddenly realise that all of my value trades... I've now equalized or gone ahead of him on card draw, and then I can only sort of win by doing really wonky plays of like procking his um, Northshire Cleric. It's quite often from Sarad and Burgle, you'll get Heagle cards, and versus Priest, you can trick them into overdrawing by using those weird combos, and they've been like very clutch. I've lost games by taking the Warlock here past versus Priest, never do it. Um, versus Paladin. You want to keep your dagger for the first half of the game. Then you want to swap into either um, heal, armor up, or mage. Those are the top three. The reason why the mage is good is you can keep pinging um, their tokens without taking any face damage. You can use it to trade more favorably. Obviously, priest and armor up are good because it just helps you restabilize. Everything below that is kind of like meh picks. Um, the, ones, the next set down would probably be um, hunter hero power above druid. The good thing about Druid is if you do get the dagger up first, you can then Druid and buff your dagger to two, um, which is kind of nice, but generally at that point in the game, you don't want to be getting only one armor per turn because it just trades equally with the uh, Paladin token. And I would much rather get the Hunter Hero Power because it lets you apply pressure. Even though this is a control list, this is a grinding list, and having that two um, progressive damage every turn is huge. Versus everything else, um, which isn't aggro, then you're kind of at Warlock Hero Power is best. If not that, you want to heal. If not that, you want um, Hunter Hero Power. I value the Hunter Hero Power surprisingly high. And unless it's against like a token class, I will nearly always value Hunter Hero Power over Mage Hero Power, for example. So that's that. One Zombie Chow. I originally ran two instead of a Finley. I've tried running two Zombie Chow, one Finley, because Finley isn't always a turn one play. But having three one drops in the deck, it makes you very weak in fatigue wars and drawn out games where you're constantly top drawing. And if you're top drawing into ones turn after turn, you just feel really bad and you'll just lose the game. So I think one of each is good enough. If you didn't like Finley, you'd run double Zombie Chow. Or if you didn't have League of Explorers, you'd run double Zombie Chow. It's basically just an amazing turn one play. It's just good. Double Eviscerate, you can easily get the combo even though we don't run too many cheap cards. The two one drops activate our combos quite easily since we don't run preps in this list. It's just standard. Even without the spell damage, it's just amazing. Double Undersea Valiant, this is kind of a controversial pick. Um, and this again is, I'd rather run cards like this than trying to buff up my Fan of Knives. I can use this plus Fan of Knives to do the two damage rather than doing like a Thalmos Fan of Knives. It's good. More often than not, you just play it on curve on turn two as just a 3-2. 
playing on curve in this deck is incredibly important. Even though you have a lot of very powerful like um, combos, inspires, and battle cries, playing on curve will always win you more games than trying to get too much value. Do not play the value game. Like if you're against anything to, from aggression to a mid range deck, just play on curve. Burst control decks. If you play on curve, obviously you don't play into like board clears. But if you play on curve, you'll actually out aggro them and you'll win. And you know you can do amazing. I've had like sort of turn six wins versus control warrior with this deck just because I run lots of early game. Double burgle. Um, even in the Anubrak version, not running Star Seeker, I'd still run double burgle. Double Burgle is amazing. It's kind of like Thought Steel. Personally, I think this is better than Thought Steel because the issue with Thought Steel is, and this happens quite a lot if you play Control Priest. Control Priest plays to fatigue. If Thought Steel is the last card in your deck or the last three cards in your deck, you get zero value from it because they have not like they've usually drawn through their whole deck at that point. So sometimes Thought Steel is just dead. Also, Thought Steel versus a fair few classes, you'll get like half of a combo, and half of a combo is worthless. Um, getting random class cards. Class cards are generally better than neutrals. You nearly always get something good. Generally how it works is you get one good card, then one mediocre card. Um, you don't ever play Burgle on curve. Basically, Burgle will kind of sit dead in hand until you have just some floating mana, which happens quite often with control lists, or in the late game to try and get a possible answer. Because we do run the Star Seeker, if you ever get the worst case scenario of Burgling into two dead cards, it's still value because you can then turn those into legendaries. So it kind of all works out. Two fan of knives is mandatory in any rogue list. This is what makes the rogue more interesting than say a control warrior um, or a warlock is it has this early power versus paladins which makes it incredibly strong. The early rogue hero power plus fan of knives is what makes this deck viable is the amount of paladins you queue into on ladder. One BGH. I've run with two BGHs and I've run with no BGHs and use stuff like SAP instead. I much prefer one BGH instead of running SAP in this list because this is a control list. If you SAP it back, you're just getting bad value because they will replay it. Yes, you can do RAG SAP, which is the strongest turn template in pretty much the entire game. And it will sometimes win you games, but more often than not, I prefer just having the standard BGH. Um, it's incredibly good also versus Priest because you can use it to kill your threats, which they steal. Um, the advantage of running two BGH is it makes it more consistent. I like running consistent tech um, in this kind of a list. Because you don't have much card draw, the chance of you drawing into things is low. So if you have a two of, it's more likely you'll have one by turn seven, which is pretty straightforward. Because we run Star Seeker, you can potentially turn the dead one into something else. So it works. So you can tinker around with playing two. One Earthen Ring faster. This is like the one solid tech choice in the list. This is the one card which can change. If I'm going against a lot of control, I will drop this and run double BGH. Um, if I'm going against a lot of like very aggressive decks, um, and when I say aggressive, I mean like face decks, I always sub this in. If I'm going against a lot of like Zooey decks, which just sort of flood the board, I'll sometimes swap this for a mind control tech. It just sort of depends what you're going against. Earthen Ring Farsa is the most consistent of all those three potential three drops. Um, it's good versus control, it's good versus zoo, it's good versus aggro. It's pretty much set in stone for me, but if you wanted to like change one tech card, this is the slot. Double SI is amazing, we have enough early game, we can easily activate it. Playing it turn three on curves, a 3 3 is perfectly fine, I do it in quite a lot of games. Just solid. One Sabotage. Um, again, this is a rogue list. Why would I play rogue over in any other class? So like Warlock, you need a reason to play it. You have to run one more hard removal other than BGH. Because if they play a Ysera, you need a way to kill it. Because we don't run Sap, and if we only had BGH, we just can't kill it. You can tinker with using either this or Assassinate if you're running a budget version of this list and you don't have Sabotage, run Assassinate instead. The reason why I prefer Sabotage to Assassinate is kind of twofold. They do similar things at different mana costs. Some people say, oh, it's the same card, but one mana cheaper. More often than not, when there's like a Tyrion on the board, there's a 1-1 dude next to it. More often than not, if you're against a Dragon Priest and they play Ysera, it's not empty on the board. So there's a certain risk which happens in probably a third of the times you want to play Sabotage, maybe even more, maybe a half of the times, you have a risk of hitting the wrong target, and that can just straight lose you the game. The reason why I do include the Sabotage, though, is because of Doomhammer, because of Ashbringer, because of Jaraxxus. 
there are so many weapon classes on ladder at the moment because if we just quickly count them off you have paladin warrior shami hunter warlock running jaraxxus then you have rogue and then you know maybe weird they steal your cards or whatever right but that is straight up six that's pretty good um just as four mana removal it's good enough if you get the value with the weapon destruction it's amazing originally i tried running something which i saw on another list which was double bgh one sabotage one harrison to like hard hard counter um paladin and um warrior players the issue i had with running harrison jones is it's kind of weak on curve and again you don't want to be drawing into your deck so i'd much rather have a sabotage effect at least we've already covered but it's basically just your win condition you can play it on curve versus aggro it's just really solid double refreshment vendor we run zombie chows if you run two zombie chows rather than just one then there's no reason not to play this card when i first tried to make this deck work i kept like cutting vendor and going oh but i don't want to be healing the enemy it's really good you can play it on curve and generally it won't do anything like it will either heal you a little bit heal the enemy a little bit or heal neither of you for anything um, versus face playing on curve is amazing in control in, usually in control you're the early aggressor so i tend to like hold back on it a little bit so if i had elise and refreshment vendor on turn four i'd play the elise first hold on to the vendor one interesting thing you can do versus warlocks is if you suspect they're going to be setting up a molten giant turn you can vendor and completely screw up their plans and no one ever plays around a refreshment vendor into molten giant this isn't something which happens like every Warlock game, but it happens fairly uh, often. I'd probably say one in three Warlock games, I kind of twist around their Molten Giants. It's just kind of powerful. Again, even if you're running a Nubrak instead of Star Seeker, we need a lot of healing. Rogue inherently doesn't have much defense. That's why we run Farseer, Double Vendor, Double Healbot. You need this much healing in this list. If you cut the healing, this list will not work. Do not cut healing. If you want to add tech, cut other things, but do not cut healing. Double heal bot, as just said, we need it, otherwise this deck doesn't work. Skulker, we've already covered, it's just very strong. Nexus Champion Sarad is basically a mini Ysera. I've heard a few people mention this on like, the competitive uh, Hearthstone Reddits. I completely agree. This is basically a um, Ysera you can play on curve. Playing this just on um, turn 5 as a Yeti is perfect. It is good enough. Um, the good thing about this particular deck is that with both Star Seeker and Nexus Champion Sarad, you have two like mini win conditions you can play on curve, which is huge. You get loads of value out of this, it's always good. I've never had a game where I've played and gone, oh I wish I was running a Lotheb for example instead, and Lotheb can win you games. This is just huge. The fact that you run Star Seeker also removes the chance of getting bad cards because you can just turn it to something else. Double Sludge, again it's mandatory. In control, it's huge. It's imperfect versus control warrior, they struggle getting through it. Versus control priest, they struggle killing it. Versus everything else, it just stops face damage, never change. Sylvanas is probably the weakest slot in the entire list. Um, you can experiment running with Emperor Tharrison instead of Sylvanas. A lot of the early control rogue lists did make that change. Like They either ran Sylvanas Tharrison or Trade Prince Tharrison. Um, the reason why I chose to run Sylvanas over Tharrison is kind of twofold. This deck does struggle with like hard removal outside of the one BGH and the one Sabotage, so it's kind of reliant on having lots of things on board or stealing removal through stuff like Burgle and Nexus Champion. So having the Sylvanas and the threat of that hard removing something is huge. Um, it's just very good. It's also a much more enticing entomb target. Priests don't have answers to Sylvanas, they will nearly always entomb it, whereas they will death something like a Tharazan and it won't bait out the entomb. I just kind of, I really like it. Another thing is, and this is why people do like to run Tharazan, is that if you have Tharazan, it makes your new brack cheaper. Because this list doesn't run a new brack, it doesn't have that potential weight. Um, making your Burgles cheaper, making your Nexus Champion cheaper, all of that stuff, it's cute and it sometimes works, but I often find Sylvanas just slightly more consistent. The way this deck works, because it doesn't run much card draw, is if you draw into your Burgles and your Nexus Champion, you refill your hand. If you don't draw into them, by turn 6 you'll only have like 3 cards in your hand, and that isn't much value. So I just, I find Sylvanas more consistent, but if you wanted to cut a card and change a card, this would be the card you'd swap around with. That and the Earthen Ring Farsir. I think the Farsir is stronger in this deck than Sylvanas, you know, that crazy. Um, Trade Prince Gallywix is amazing, it is a win condition in and of itself, it wins you games versus Priest, because in Tomb, just, uh, it's so so good. 
um, people say, what about Druid? What about Mage? Um, Druid really struggles to kill Gallywix. I think Gallywix has won me more Druid games than it's lost. I think in the entire time I've played this list, and in all the different variations, I probably have about 200, maybe 300 games played with this list. Or variations of. It's probably also one to maybe two um, Druid you know, games where they do like Innovate, Coin, 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 Triple, Savage, Raw. You know, your face falls off. Um, they just can't kill it. They don't have any 8 attack creatures, unless it's aggro, and aggro you can just get rid of the fell even no problem. Um, they have to use swipes into it, they need to do weird things, and they just give you removal. It just it wins you straight up games. Mage is the only, and the only matchup this is bad. Um, with Mage, I basically do not play the Gallywix until after the Flame Wakers have been dealt with, and after the Archmage has been dealt with. And usually you can do that. We have Double Eviscerate, which deals with the Flame Wakers, no problem. The Archmage is usually just a clean sabotage, as they nearly always play it on an empty board. You then play Trade Prince, and you've won the game. What often happens is they will play Archmage, get one or two Fireballs. I kill the Archmage, I then play the Gallywix. They have to sink their Fireballs into killing the Gallywix. I then have the Fireballs, and I win the game. They just concede more often than not. Do not cut it. If you do not have this card... You could maybe try running a Tharazan instead, but if you do not have this card, I would probably recommend playing a different list. This is crucial and why playing Control Rogue works. This is why you play this rather than a different control list, like Warlock, for example. Boom is just Dr. Boom. Ragnaros, it's a good threat. It gives you a second BGH target, which I like. It's playable on turn 8, so you curve out very nicely. A lot of my lists recently have been like really looking at just curving out well. If you look at the curve, that's a very good curve for a control deck. Um, it's very rare you just have dead cards in your hand, which you can't play. It just works seamlessly. So that's kind of all of that and all of that. Um, cards which you could maybe add in. You could maybe add in a Black Knight instead of a Sylvanas. That would be something I'd quite appreciate in some matchups. I still feel like the meta isn't slow enough. Oh, and one other quick thing I'll quickly say versus Trade Prince Gallywix. He is more often than not your straight win condition versus Aggro Shaman. Agro Shemi has no way to deal with Gallywix it's outside of just using all of their burn. They either need to OTK you, in which case you're dead anyway, but usually you've healed enough that they can't. Um, because we run so much excessive healing, we run 16 points from this, 8 points from this, and 3 from this, that we that just like counteracts all their burn. So they need to slowly chip away at you using their charge minions and their burn. So you, the second you play Gallywix, they need to hard remove it. And you just then have, you know, a lava burst, a crackle, a lightning bolt in hand, and you just, you know, trade their minions and it's chill. It's chill. So now that we've kind of very exhaustively gone through the list, and I realize this has been quite a long video, but there's quite a lot to cover, I'm going to play three games. Um, the reason why I'm going to just play three straight games unedited is often people cherry pick. I don't like doing that. I feel like it, me just showing you three games where I completely destroyed wouldn't be good. Um, so we're just going to play three straight games. If we lose three straight games, we lost three straight games. Again, this is at rank 4. Okay, it's not legend rank, but I've used this deck to ladder before. Not this current version, because, you know, this is the first, like, full LOE season. But this works. It is viable. You can get legend with this deck list. So let's see. Versa Paladin, we want to hard mulligan for 1 drops, SI agents, Valiance, and the fan. So this is already a pretty good hand. We've gone second. Going second is always good. Because we've gone second, I'm going to keep the BGH. Because every Paladin list has some form of BGH target. That's a pretty good hand. Um, we will coin out a play if there's potential to get a good combo trade. Otherwise, I'm just going to play this straight on curve. Okay. Looking pretty good thus far. Again, playing on curve is more important than trying to get value out of your um, hero powers and stuff. Well, not your hero powers, but out of your combo cards. Okay, so this is kind of an awkward one. Um, for this, I will coin out the SI to proc that off. We could have hero powered, done, then done the hero power and saved the coin, then coin something out on three. But it's kind of awkward. I'm probably just going to want to hero power next turn anyway. Um, this gives me something closer onto the board. If he plays a secret keeper or another threat, I just kind of prefer this. I like being proactive with the list. Okay, so here, for example, he did that trade. I know I don't have it right now, but if, for example, I had a Farseer, that would have completely counteracted it, and that happens quite common, because I see Paladins trade like that. Um, in this case, we're just going to play the Valiant. 
we could hero power, we could proc this, kill one of the things, but then we don't have anything on the board. I find versus Paladin, the way that you beat them is you just can test them with the board control because it's such a board centric deck. Okay, he plays the mini bot. Right, so here we've got a slightly awkward turn. Um, we could just straight play the refreshment vendor, but we'll be healing him. We wouldn't be getting value out of it. We've picked up the Valiant, which is a pretty nice pickup. Um, I'm kind of tempted to do a hero power, play Valiant, and do some trading. And I think that's probably what I'm going to do. Because he has the uh, Divine Shield, I always want to proc Divine Shield. I just hate leaving Divine Shield up. We're just going to play this. And we want to... We want to eke out value. We want to keep his board under control. So we're going to go for that trade. Again, we don't mind if we take a little bit of face damage. Because we have the heals coming up. And we could have killed the 2-2. Two -two, but he would have had an extra 1-1. One -one if he plays a competitive spirit or something. We're just in a bad place. So here we clean that up, and we're in a pretty good spot. As you can see, we've curved out quite nicely. Hopefully we can just play a boom on 7. Often versus Paladin, it doesn't work out like that, because you're having to remove their big threats. But, you know, we're in a pretty good standing. We set it up this way with just the Shredder alive, because if he plays a Mysterious Challenger this turn, we can um, proc the get down, and then BGH either the Shredder or the 6-6, six -six, depending on which one gets buffed. Uh, there are two different lines of play. We can throw this one out and let this one get hit. Or we can hero power, do the hero power out. I'm going to do the hero power out because if it procs onto this, he'll have a harder time getting through it. And having the extra health versus that will be kind of nice because we'll get more trades out of it. So it wants to buff the 6-6, six -six, please. Okay, so we didn't get lucky. Well, that's okay. Um, the reason why we wouldn't hero power is so we could try and fit Burglin on curve. Oh, that's kind of frustrating. Right, so we just trade into that. That's pretty good. Hopefully we don't get a boom, because I want to play my boom. And with Sabotage versus a... Oh. Wow, he buffed that one. That surprises me. I probably would have buffed the um, Armorsmith, like 100%. Right, hopefully we can clear the board and we're probably just going to sabotage that. I was going to say I like to save sabotage. Um, oh yeah, we can do plays. I want to proc this first. Okay, so let's get down. So we probably just straight clean the board. Right, we can save. It depends. Depending on how we want to do this, we can trade that into that, trade that into that, and sabotage. Or we can play a minion and save the sabotage. I think I'm going to be, go for that line of play. We're going to play this. Sack that. Do that. Okay, he gets more armor out of this line of play, um, but we get to hold on to the sabotage, which is crucial versus Tyrion. Um, it's also very good if we can kill like a big size threat plus like a true silver, if we can take like one or two charges off it, it's worth. He now plays the Tyrion. Okay, so this is kind of where it gets kind of interesting. So there's a few different ways we can do it. We can just YOLO sabotage here and pray that it kills the Tyrion, um, which I'm not that keen on doing, because if it kills the Armistice, we just straight up lose, and I'd rather use the sabotage to kill the Ashbringer. So I think what I'm going to do in this case is I'm just going to play the Dr. Boom. Um, if I just play the Dr. Boom, I'm probably going to proc the Divine Shield with my 3-5, because otherwise he'll just straight trade into the Boom. So we're going to do this. If he doesn't BGH, we're in a pretty good place. If he does BGH, then we're going to have to do some YOLO sabotage players. And can we just appreciate how much value he's getting out of that armor smith? It's ridiculous. Okay, that's scary. He's just going to go full face. Master of Battle, we can fan of knives. He's going to get a lot of armor. Consecrate. Hopefully it kills the armor smith. Kill the armor smith, please. Nope. No. Oh, that's the worst case scenario. That's literally the worst case. Alright, so he's probably going to be a face with the Tyrion here. Yeah. Okay, that's what we get. SI agent. Okay. 
Okay, so there's a few different plays. We can fan of knives SI agent to clear the 1 3, then throw a sabotage. He keeps the Ashbringer. Um, I think the Ashbringer is more threatening than the Tyrion, so I'm going to go for this line. Backstab. Oof. Mm, yeah. So he's gone like crazy, crazy value. But we've managed to get rid of that. We hold this back. We've got healing. We have Burgle. Um, so we should be okay. And we've got like, we've got a lot. If we draw into this top half of the deck, we're fine. If we draw into this half, we're kind of sad. Unless it's, we draw into Burgles and stuff. At least. So that's kind of middle ground. I'm probably going to... Okay, so let's look. We want to backstab SI agent, 100%. We want to heal, 100%. So that uses up 7 mana, so we burgle first. Okay, it gives us a solemn vigil and Tosca. Well, Tosca's pretty nice. Um, now, I want to get rid of the Shredder more so than the Sludge. Um, because the Sludge we can beat through with our board. So I'm going to go for this line of play. <laughs> We're getting a... Uh, Spectators commenting on my game here. Right, let's see what comes out of it. He's saying that uh, I'm pretty pissed off the power than wrecking his weapon. Okay, that's really good for me, so I'll just heal up. Pass. So, as you can see here, we've gotten the card draw, which is pretty nice this late into the game, um, since it, this won't go to fatigue. It'll just be one of us will win. We've gone through a lot of his threats. That's kind of frustrating, though. Okay. We can get a, um, wow, rag. I probably want to... I'm not too keen on ragging. If I could activate one more and I could rag and vigil, I would do that 100%. Ragging against this board is a bit meh. I think I'd rather just play creatures. So I think what I'm going to do is this. Um, it just has more of an actual presence. And I will take the one damage... Oof, that really hurts. The healing would have been really nice there. Um, I will take the one damage trading into that so I can definitely kill it next turn with my hero power. He might use it to trade here, like throw the 1-1, one, one, the 1-2, one, and the 3-3 three, three into one of my um, 5 health minions. But in case he doesn't, I'll feel bad. Um, so you could say, oh, that's one extra damage you didn't need to take. So if I lose this game by one damage, then that was the play. That's fine. So we're most likely just dropping rag next turn. Let's see how he does these trades. He should throw the 1-1 one, one away into a 5-5. Five, five. Is he just going to go full face? No. Okay, that's fine. Okay, that's... Right, well, whatever we do, we're doing that into that, 100%. We're doing that into that, 100%. We're yeah, probably dropping Sludge and Hero Powering up, because if we... Just drop rag and it keeps hitting the dudes, we're going to feel really bad. We could do the greedy play, which is dropping the sludge, kill that, but then that trades into it, so that's going into that, 100%. Whatever we do, we're hero powering, so we might as well do that. Um, sludge is the safer play in case he gets something like kings. Um, rag is the more YOLO play. I'm just going to play the sludge because it's more consistent. If he like draws into a silence off the top, then we would be better off playing the rag, but... I think this is I think this is the safer, more consistent play. Lay of hands on that. Wow. Okay. Well that's good. Yeah, like it's not good that he got the healing, but it's good that that was his play, because it's just kind of a dead and we can hopefully set up a solemn vigil. Secret. We're probably gonna truck proc that with our face. And it's either a second avenger or a uh, second redemption, I'm gonna assume it's a second avenge. So we wanna be aware of that. Okay, Antique, that's huge. So we're nearly definitely playing Antique. Okay, what I want to do is I want to throw the 3-2 into the 1-2. That's Avenge, yep. Yeah. Don't proc on the 2-5. That's fine. Um, we want to do that into that. We don't want to trade that into that because then he'll kill this. So we'll trade that into that. Some more damage. Which is great. We're now looking perfect to drop a rag here. 
We could be greedy. Um, like, playing the Rag is technically the greedy play. It's safer to do Healbot. But I don't think he can get past the Taunt and deal 8 damage. So we can Zombie Chow, Rag, and hopefully it kills the 2-5. I'd rather it kill a creature than go face. If it kills the 1-1, one, one, that's actually a good thing, but... Okay, I kind of jinxed that, but I'd have rather it went for the 2-5 there, obviously. Um, assuming he can't clear my Taunt and just get 7 damage out of nowhere, I think we've just won this game. Okay, that's fine. That's... Mm, that's really bad. Okay, so we probably just want to flood the board at this point to make Sylvanas less worth. That's huge. We're definitely dropping one heal bot, so we're just going to play it. Um, we want as many things on the board as possible. Playing the Skulker. Yeah, like this guy's saying <laughs> Skulker. I think I play the Skulker here. Um... It kills the knife drill. I don't want to trade my zombie chow in, so I am just going to go for this line of play. Now, do I want to um, proc the Sylvanas is the question. Do I want him to have initiative on proccing Sylvanas, or do I want to proc it myself? So one and three. Um, if he gets the rag, I just lose. No, I. if I kill it, he gets charge. So I don't make that play. Okay, that's... Yes, that's amazing. So he has to throw that into... Like, the reason why we do it this way is he needs to sacrifice it into the rag, which damages the rag. So if he steals the... That's kind of scary. But if he steals the rag, um, then he steals a 1 HP rag. Yes. Thank you. That was a really risky play. Uh, like, it was a 50-50. I'd have rather have damaged the rag because you then could have drawn in. Like, he has enough health that if he drew into, like, another, like, board clear, he'd be chill. All right, we've just straight up won this game now. We so we re-dagger up. Um, then we Finley reset it. And we just want health. Um, this is more versatile. Just do that. Do that. Hit him with a happy feast of wind spell. And that's kind of how this deck works. So as you can see, this is exactly how we like to use the Finley. Is you use it in the late game, um, after you've gotten substantial value out of your hero power. And remember, you can always hero power, get your dagger, then swap it. That doesn't do anything. Unless he draws into a weapon. He drew into a weapon. Alright, you just hit that rag and you just pray that you can kill it. The problem he had... Oh, I would have tried to kill the rag. Um... The issue he has with this line of play, I want to take the face damage. Um, and I'm going to heal. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Do that. Heal that to full. Heal face. Like, if he hit the rag, um, yes, I could just keep, like, out hero powering it, but at least it would force me to heal the rag rather than healing face, because he could threaten to kill it with his weapon. Okay, so that kind of gives you quite a good idea of how the deck operates. Do two more games. Hopefully we go against some aggro matchups so I can sort of show you how to play the aggro games. But yeah, so as I showed you on the deck tracker earlier, um, and I'll bring it up again just quickly while we search for a new opponent. Um, this was running with a, like a 56% it was for this game, but again, I was playing at like 5 in the morning making terrible misplays. This is a more realistic, I think that once you have a larger sample size of, say, like 100 games, you'll probably average around 60, probably 60, maybe 61, 62% win rate. Uh, as someone who's part of this deck for a long time, it's easily able to obtain that. If you consistently go against good matchups, then having like a 70% win rate is possible, but it's like not realistic. There are some bad matchups. Um, Combo Druid is probably the worst matchup for this deck, just because they can just burst you from nothing. This is a Paladin, so we're going to throw everything back except for the SI. Um, keeping Farseer on turn... Since we've gone first, we, there's less chance we'll get a combo, but we might draw into a backstab. See, that's why I kept it. Arguably, because I was expecting I'd just be playing it as a vanilla 3-3 three, three on 3, there's the chance you draw into the backstab. Um, so we have potential for getting combos here. 
here, I'm probably just going to backstab that. Um, because we could hold a turn. Okay, well, let's... let's if we, hold, if we held back a turn, we just played this vanilla. He buffs this twice. Maybe he kills this. No, we just... This is the safer play. Um, we could have potentially just played the vanilla 3-2, um, not killed it. Next turn he plays two secrets and we kill it with the SI. Um, but he might have gotten shenanigans. We could have lost out. It's like not good to be greedy. Just play on curve. Uh, on curve, um, SI is fine. Just hero powering here is also fine. Um, we don't have a turn 4 play. And because we don't have a turn 4 play, I'd rather just put something on the board. Um, the reason why I've done that is that I'm nearly always just hero powering next turn anyway. So I would rather hero power next turn and get to play something this turn. Um, if he uh, musters a battle here, it's kind of bad. He gets to kill the 3-1, but he would have gotten to kill that anyway. So he just would have killed it like one turn later, if that makes sense. We drew into the zombie chow, so that's perfect. So we can do this. Again, I could go face, but I'd rather just control the board. Um, he would have most likely, if I'd gone face, he would have most likely just traded everything in. But if he plays the kings on curve, he would have done it and kept the extra 1-1s. Um, I just always like to reset the board. The reason why I always like to reset the board so hard versus Paladin is kings and competitive spirit. It's just not good. Okay, again, if you got the true silver, it wouldn't have mattered. That seems weird. I don't really get that play. Um, we're going to play this on curve. It's weak to Consecrate, but we're hoping he doesn't have Consecrate. He probably doesn't have it in the top nine cards of his deck. Most lists only run one Consecrate, since this is a Secret Pally, an aggressive one running Secret Keeper. And, yeah. So, hopefully we draw into a minion. This is good enough value. If we drew into like a taunt or something, that'd be the dream. Fan of knives. Okay, that's kind of dead. Um, just do that. What do we get? Seal of champions. Worth. Like, you can't be greedy with your um, Sarad. Again. When you're playing against the aggressive decks, the way you beat them is you just play on curve, you try and match them, and you will eventually stabilize. It's when they just, like, carry the board away completely, that's when you lose. I'm probably going to fan here. Like, I could backstab fan clear. I know fan is amazing, but he's already used one muster. Um... Yeah, we're going to backstab fan. Hmm. Yeah. We if he resurrects the Lothab with one HP, we're kinda screwed. Now it gets buffed by the Avenge. Right, it's not like we kind of get screwed, but we can just eviscerate anyway, so that's kind of why I went for that line. Eviscerate, okay, so now our option is to do this. It procs the noble. That doesn't. Okay, so that's competitive spirit, we assume. We could have played the Finley, but we've got enough health that we can try and get more value. We could have burgled. Um, burgling there was probably okay. I'm not sure. We've got the BGH. So we want to hopefully proc this on the 6 6. If we proc this on the 6 6, we're fine. We're playing BGH nearly 100% of the time. Okay, so we just need to pray. That's Naval Sack. That will take the res. Got buff the 6 6. Believe. Okay. It's a really fun and interactive deck, this. You've got to love it. Um, Gully Wix is probably the play. And the problem with Gallywix is he can kill it with the challenger in the 2-1. He's probably just going to go face, face, face. 
we could burgle would be the best case. The burgle best case would be like we burgled into some kind of equality, but we can still do that next turn. Like next turn, best case is equality consecrate. We can't play that this turn. I'd rather just put something on the board. So I'm gonna do this and ah, okay. I rushed my play. What I should have done is I should have checked with the Finley. I make mistakes when I do my commentaries. I did it in my uh, yesterday's Dragon Warrior video. Um, that may have screwed us over a little bit. I should have checked with the Finley. Um, he plays five secrets. It was obvious. I had the secrets up. I was just focusing more on the commentary than the game. Give me some leeway for that. But that was a big, big misplay. But... We can BGH now, so there's that, yeah? Um, oof. Okay, so we're probably going for the Burgle before the BGH, unless we draw into something when we're playing on curve. Elise. No, we're going for the Burgle over the Elise. What did we get? Mysterious Challenger of our own. Okay. Well, that's amusing. Um, we can still stabilize this game. So we're going to do this, this. And then I'm probably going to Seal of Champions it, because it threatens the 6-6. Uh, six, six. If he has a BGH of his own, like, I've kind of... I can still stabilize at this point, but I need to be risky. Um, if we like, if we hadn't screwed up, he would have had to have thrown that... Oh, oh my... <laughs> I hate this deck so much. Um, right, so we're going to assume second... Oh, wow. We're going to assume second Noble Sack, um, and then people tend to run two Competitive Spirits more so than two Repentance. Heal bot. Okay, well we know it's second Noble Sack, so we need to heal before we trigger it. So we have to do that. Okay. Um, we've lost the game. Okay, is there is there a way Finley can save us? I think Finley can save us. I'm not sure how yet. I need to work out hero power. Uh, I would have wanted the mage hero power. I'm not doing any maths. I'm just sort of like clicking on things. I'm I'm dead. Whatever way I do this, I'm dead. If we'd gotten the um, mage hero power, we could have potentially done a thing. No, we would have still been dead. The misplay was the um, not checking with Finley to proc on the Gazler. That did straight up lose this game. But you can kind of see, you know, we were drawing into the heal. Mm, you could have stabilized there. Right, come on, let's give us not a Paladin, yeah? We're actually, I think the Paladin matchup is... Mid-range, we're favoured. Um, versus Secret Pally, we're still favoured, but it kind of goes from, like... A 55%, it's like 50 to 55% of our secret palette. It's basically an even matchup, really. Because even though we have so many answers for their deck, they're such an obnoxious deck, they win anyway. Um, verse Warlock, okay, so the way that you decide if you want to keep a this rate is do they have a 4 HP minion that I want to kill? Um, we may want a this rate for Imp Gang Boss. Um, the dagger, like, this is where we have a slight issue, right? The dagger versus zoo is pretty strong, so we can kill off their implosions. Versus control, it's weak, so a turn on Finley, Finley would be strong versus that. I'm probably just going to go for this hand. At least. Okay, so we're probably just going to play this straight on curve. Um, mm. Okay, so okay, we, we want to save the coin for boom. Um, I do think I'm just going to play the Finley on curve. What would be the best case hero power? The best case hero power would either be Warlock. Priest is good versus both Zoo and um, Control. And then maybe Hunter hero power. I think I'm just going for Hunter hero power. It, it puts pressure on him tapping. We could have gone for the mage hero power to still get good trades. Um, but the hunter hero power just gives us pressure so he can't tap too much. Again, we just want to play on curve. We really want to save the coin for the boom. Even if we can get a good SI, it's arguably better to hold it for the boom. It depends on what the play is. Um, 
but it looks like, yeah, we're just playing an on-curve. We're just going to completely curve this game. Okay, that's good. We can use that to activate the Eviscerate if he plays like a Farison or something. Hmm. So I'm going to assume it's either some kind of Reno or Malilock. Okay, I'm now assuming Malilock. Um, that hits for six. Trade that in. We could. No, we just want to kill it. Zombie child versus hero power. I just want board presence at this point. So I'm going to go for the zombie chow. The hero power is more efficient, but I just want stuff on the board. We're now playing Elise. Like, the fact that we have to play Elise off-curve now is kind of a bit... Meh. BGH, that's really nice, in case it gets something crazy off that. We're just gonna keep going face. We could trade if he got Morganus, like, meh. We could have traded before playing this, then maybe bgh if he got Morganus off the top. Um, but if if it's something we couldn't clear, I don't want to effectively give him, like, charge on his demon. Okay, so we could coin boom, but that's a bad idea. I think I just want to BGH the 8-8. I could kill the 3-1 with the Chow, or the 3-5. I might do the Chow, because it's not as weak to Hellfire. If he gets Malganus, we're going to kill the Malganus. If he gets nothing, then that's best case. If he got nothing, that's best case. Do that. Fit in the hero power. Like, sometimes it's good to kill the Void Callers early because a lot of these lists, especially if they're Reno, they're only running like two, maybe three demons. Most lists are just doing Malganus, Jaraxxus, and some are running a Doom Guard to make it slightly more consistent. The fact he's running that makes me think it's not Reno because you can't really fit everything into a Reno list. We don't need to trade. We could trade, but we don't need to, so I'm just going to do that. Twisting Nether would be kind of bad here, but mm. We don't want to play into like a power of a whelm clear. The fact he did that means he doesn't have it. So we're probably going to play Champion Sarad next turn and hero power again. We basically just want to keep applying constant pressure. And if it is Reno, we want to burn him before he draws into the Reno, before he draws into like the brand Healbot, Healbot, Healbot. Um, what I really like about this deck is because of the way I've curved it, is even though it's a very heavy control deck through, you know, the Serad, um, the Elise, and the Rag, you can kind of play it more like mid-range. Uh, let's see what we get off this first. We still have the coin, we might be able to coin something out. We've got something crazy like Betrayal. Rock by the weapon. That's pretty decent. Um... We could rock by the weapon the 1-1, one, one, throw it into the 4-2, pray that it hit... No, that's just stupid. We're just going to go for the safe play, which is this. Now, do we go face? If we go face, um, we are one off lethal. Um, he can't tap, he can heal, it plays into Shadow Flame. I think I'm just going to trade... Actually, no, we do this, we check, because if this goes face, it didn't go face. Sad times, feels bad, man. If it hit it for more, we could have done something. If it hit that, we could have done something. I think I'm just going to do that, because Shadow Flame is a card, I'm going to do that trade. It feels bad doing it that way. Um, we could have had lethal. Taunt Shadow Flame would kind of hurt her. Okay, that's fine. Hero Power of Return. Unleash the Dogies. That's pretty decent. Okay, so we're going to do... If we play this, that's 3 damage, 6 damage... Hmm, it's all kind of a bit slightly off curve. Might just play the sludge. I think I'm gonna do this. Sludge. I'm gonna throw this into this. 
to deny the Shadow Flame. Protect that. I, like, I want him to have to use Power Realm and Shadow Flame or to Shadow Flame the Taunt. And he's never going to Shadow Flame that Taunt. Like, there's no way he's Shadow Flaming that Taunt. And I can just straight up outvalue him. Because um, I have the Serrat on board, so he has to kill it. I think you can hear the soaring which is going on outside, so thankfully that started in the last game. Apologies if that's really obnoxious. I'll try and see if there's something I can do about that in the edit. But yeah, so if you have any questions about this deck, by the way, just leave them down in the comments. If you have any other suggestions for them, I do my best to reply to every single comment on my videos. Um, so, you know, da 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 da. And uh, I'm going to be uploading more of these. These do not take priority. Again, for my um, WoW viewers, these do not take priority of my WoW um, content. It's just these are something I've been wanting to do for a while now. It's annoying because we had lethal <laughs> that other turn. Um, but it's just, it's all a bit kind of awkward. I think we just do something like this. We want to just keep playing minions because minions are good. It kills that. It weakens that. It weakens every like it just kind of weakens everything. Um, and hopefully he doesn't get the heal, and we can do some kind of like eviscerate hero power play and just win. Again, we would have won if that beam bot wasn't you know a boom bot. This is why I don't like. If I could, I would cut um, Doctor Boom from all of my lists because I hate boom bot RNG. Because I hate how it decides games. Do not Reno. Do not Jaraxxus. Do not heal bot. He heal bot it. Okay. Feels bad, man. Okay, we can clear the giant there because he's overcommitted on the board. Sludge. Okay, so our play looks something like this. That goes into that. That goes into that. Play this. Hold on to those. Chill. He's used both mortal coils. Um, if he hadn't, I would probably would have sacked those. Um, but... Mm. We've got card draw, we could potentially draw into a rag, we could draw into a sabotage, burgles, we've got like quite a few outs here. Another really good thing about burgle, which I forgot to mention, since there's so many warlocks on ladder, there's a decent chance, like it sounds far-fetched, when you run two burgles and Sarad, it happens surprisingly often, that you can um, get sacrificial packs and just insta-kill their Jaraxxus. Okay, so we want to... Golden Monkey first, it's cheaper than Fan. We're probably fanning anyway this turn. We've got the Gallywix, that is beautiful. Okay, because we've got that, we're just gonna do this. And we will trade into the board. He could do like a Power of Whelm Shadow Flame play, but then I get both Power of Whelm and Shadow Flame, so you know. Um, the only bad thing about Gallywix, and I will say this, is there are a fair few Warlocks running combo. If you faceless a Gallywix, it really hurts. Um, because most of our removal comes through spells. So it's just kind of eek. Alright, we're fan of vibes in 100%. Give us something good. Valiant off the top. GG. Uh, we want to just keep playing minions. We could hear a power, but you know, the heal is good here. Just keeps good stuff on the board. Like, seriously, honestly, Valiant is so good. And it's like I said, because I've cut the spell damage package, it just works like having spell damage. We like drawing into. It's like, you know when you draw into Thalnos after you fan and you kind of like just hate yourself? You don't have that with this because you don't have that awkward um, ordering. Okay, 100% we trade this into this. Heal again. We could have held it for a turn to get one extra healing, but not playing something would be really stupid. Uh, he does get a favourable trade here, but again, can you see how much work we've gotten from the Hunter here? It's just going to keep pressuring him. He's gone through both heal bots now. He almost definitely runs Duraxus in this list. That's kind of annoying. Hopefully we draw something nicer. Sabotage. Oof. Okay. So there's a few plays. We hear a pang regardless. We can 50-50 that it kills the A8. But he's going to Duraxus soon. And we don't want Duraxus to have his weapon. So we just have to take the face damage. Um, if it killed the 3-1, it could maybe take the Duraxus off him. But here we go. You see what I'm saying? Like... Uh, the dream is we draw in something which kills the 3-1, then we can kill the AA and the weapon. That's like the dream. Oh, you, you see guys? Like, you just gotta take the damage. That's really nice. That's like, I don't really care which one I kill. Just chill. Um, I like playing minions, so I'm just gonna play a minion. 
he kind of has to trade and use like dart bombs and stuff. Most of this only run one, they don't run two in this kind of traditional handlock format. It's fine. That's less fine. We still have threats. Um, that isn't one of them. So, pretty close game. Um, coin, backstab, concede. But, you know, we had lethal, he got some lucky draws. You know, you can kind of see how this deck sort of operates. Um, outs we could have had. Ooh, a rank 5 feels bad, man. Uh, we could have drawn into burgles, we could have gotten board players, we could have gotten sack packs, we could have gotten just, like, good minions. Um, we could have drawn into a Sylvanas, a Rag, Golden Monkey in, like, the last few turns. Like, we kind of just curved out poorly. But, yeah, so that's the deck. If you've got any questions, any suggestions, leave them down below. Um, and, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Just try it out. Anyway, I'm Taki Cat. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again tomorrow with some more videos. Bye-bye.